to introduce Christopher. Uh, Christopher Salcedo was born and raised in pre-hit Brooklyn. After receiving his BFA from New York School of Visual Arts and MFA from the University of Michigan, he attended the Skowhegan, did I pronounce that correctly? Skowhegan, yes, excellent. Uh, School of Painting and Sculpture, and then did postgraduate work at the Queen's University of Belfast in Northern Ireland. In 1992, Salcedo joined the faculty of the University of New Orleans, where he ran the sculpture program for 20 years, retiring as chairperson. He continues to teach at Adelphi University on Long Island. Over the past 30 years, Salcedo has exhibited artwork in over 100 exhibitions throughout the world and produced several public sculptures throughout the United States. His artwork is in the permanent collection of the New Orleans Museum of Art and the National September 11th Museum in New York City. Salcedo's work has been featured and reviewed in the New York Times, London Times, Art News, Sculpture Magazine, and on NPR. He divides his time between Rockaway and New Orleans, and his artwork is represented by the Arthur Roger Gallery. September 11th, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and then Hurricane Sandy and Rockaway Beach each significantly impacted and redirected Salcedo's life and narrative of his work. Currently, he is recovering from coronavirus. So um, we are really glad that you are well and you are here and joining us. So thank you. Um, before I, I switch over to the, um, to the PowerPoint slide, however, if everyone uh, can hold up what they're working on, um, so this is, uh, you should have gotten, uh, access to the, the coloring sheet, so you can just, oh, nice. or if you are, um, working on something else, yay, excellent, fantastic, great, um, so at the end we'll share again, but Christopher, let's, uh, let me share the screen, and we can go ahead and get started. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me, and, and thanks for the wonderful, generous introduction. And I have to say, when you showed the uh, the coloring book page, it it's a wonderful idea, and I really support the coloring night. Um, as an artist, and as a student for many years, and now as a professor for even more, it's so important to have something to do with your hands while you're listening to a boring lecture. And um, I think this is a great way of letting everyone have their idle hands do something, uh, which also kind of engages them in the activity itself, because they're at least putting mustaches on my, my works of art and having fun messing them up, which I think is really just a wonderful, expressive and subversive and uh, enabling way to get people involved. I hope your coloring night catches on. I think it's a terrific idea, perhaps born out of my dog, sorry. Sorry, I got a little Born out of the coronavirus uh, quarantine, but, but the coloring night is a great idea. Give people something to do while someone talks to them. That's a great idea. Anyway, oh, thank you. So, yeah. so anyway, thanks for the introduction, and I'm, I'm happy to take you through my work. Um, so, so normally when I talk about my work, I start chronologically in the beginning, but as I get older and as my body of work grows, we just decided to jump in about midway through. So we skipped the first 15 or 20 years, and now we're starting with uh, this image, which is important. Um, how, however, it, it does it does exclude the prior 20-year evolution. Um, so this big, uh, modern-looking uh, Brancusi kind of modern object uh, is a kind of a big penny weight, kind of like something you would see much smaller on a pharmacy scale in days of old or at a post office in days of old. And, and if you jump back a couple of slides, um, you'll see... There's the penny weight, and on top of it is a small cartoon drawing. And the cartoon drawing is important because when I started School of Visual Arts back in the early 80s, um, I was a cartooning major, and I thought art was only cartoons because that was what was available in unhip Brooklyn at the local candy stores and, and comic books and uh, Mad Magazine and, um, and that world of, of uh, popular illustration was kind of my life and something I could emulate and copy. Um, I also grew up um, around a lot of builders and, and uh, tradesmen. So building things came naturally to me. Uh, I didn't learn until later in my undergrad studies that building things was sculpture um, and that sculpture was art. So, so I started as a cartoonist, 
And then I became a sculptor and then I became a professor of sculpture. And then I had to really be like super sculptor and like run a foundry and a metal shop and a wood shop and, and kind of uh, test myself against those big uh, mediums and those big fields, and those big traditions, which I happily did. And I love it and continue to. Um, but then back to the cartooning and the comic books. So here you see a comic, an eight panel comic strip drawing of um, a boy filling a barrel with water getting in the barrel, displacing his volume, measuring it, weighing himself, and then doing a little math, calculating it, and coming up with this, this uh, penny weight, this, this empirical measure of himself. Um, and it's a, a series I did called um, uh, Self-Portraits, an exact weight and volume only. And really, I was interested in how big a sculpture should be. I was a professor. Of, so th this piece weighs one Saucedo. You see my name on top. And then the next slide, you see um, variations on the theme. So, so my heroes from the cartooning world uh, were, were from the Mad Magazine Marvel comic world, but my, my heroes in the world of sculpture at the time were kind of like Richard Serra, and I don't, although I don't admire him, I couldn't help but measure myself against people like Jeff Koons. So I kept wondering how big a sculpture should be and how big my sculpture should be. So I made this body of work, which was exactly my size, my weight and volume. And here you see variations of that. After Hurricane Katrina, I cut a notch of it out, kind of like a pound of flesh removed. I had lost a little weight. Here's a more polished portrait of the, the whole family, family portrait in exact weight and volume only, where you see the four penny weights of different sizes, and then behind it, the, uh, the kind of stoic portrait of the family. Next. We can keep going. Right, so one of my heroes, of course, Brancusi and, and, and my love for modernism, but also Brancusi with his thumb on the, on the shutter. Um, mother, father, sister, brother, and the date we took the photograph. Um, and the piece has traveled pretty well around the world, and when it was shown in Istanbul, um, I didn't speak any Turkish, but people understood it pretty clearly. If you can jump back one. So this image is the final photograph, and this image is wonderful because it talks about, this is a standalone photograph that talks about the four of us together, but if you look at the difference between each photograph and each piece, a different member of the family is depressing the shutter. Um, and that kind of gave each person the power of, of controlling the moment. And if you nu nuance, if you stare at the photograph carefully, you'll see a slight uh, variation in everyone's uh, awareness and alertness. Anyway, this, this proudly hangs in our home. Um, here's a bunch of variations of the self-portraits in exact weight and volume. Oh, yeah, this is important. Um, go back one. Right, so this is self-portrait in exact weight and volume for New Orleans. Instead of a metal container, this is a clear acrylic container, and I filled it with these figures. If you move to the next image. So I'm in London on my way to teach at the University of New Orleans Rome program, and this is 2004, five, 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 five. And uh, we stop in the Houston neighborhood, and we have a nice meal, and meet this cool uh, restaurant tour guy. And in his window, next slide. Um, yeah, the Houston station, spelled with an E, um, <laughs> and my little family. Anyway, this is, this is we, we go to this place, and we have a nice meal, and we see a work of art in the window of this kind of a colonial figure, this wonderful Guy, Guyanese carving. Uh, and I think about it all summer. But while we're in Rome teaching, uh, there's the London and Madrid bombings. And, uh, of course, my family and I are very sensitive to September 11th, so we feel a solidarity. When we come back to London, we go up to the same neighborhood, and we put flowers on the kind of spontaneous uh, sites and um, sites of grief and, 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 and uh, memorial. And then we go back to that guy, and we buy that figure that was in the window. So if we keep going. So I buy those things. I get home. I buy the figure. I get home to New York in 2005 or, uh, in uh, middle August. And then uh, Hurricane Katrina comes two weeks later. So, so I've got this, this cool wooden figure, this colonial figure. And for those of you who don't know, colonial figures are, um, curiously, they're, they're figures carved by uh, uh, African uh, woodcarvers, but often they emulate um, the uh, colonial oppressors. So, so in a complicated way, uh, an African carves himself as a rich, fat, British, successful Westerner. So I've got that in my house in New Orleans. And, and uh, now if we jump ahead, we'll, we'll, yeah, keep going, keep going. Yeah. So the house floods, everything's destroyed. My cabinets are full of water. 
these full glasses of water come to play. But there he is. There's the figure I purchased laying face down. So in a way, he's in my uh, studio bathroom in New Orleans, and he's left behind, and he survives Hurricane Katrina. My house had eight feet of water in it, and he's left face down when the water finally drains away. And I really, I take him as a symbol for, 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 um, for, for Katrina and New Orleans and the, the, the African diaspora experience and for what's great about New Orleans and for what the complexity of colonialism means. And uh, I worked with the figure for a long time. So I took a mold from him and I restored him and I made a bunch of work with this figure who became this uh, allegory for really for the ghost of New Orleans. Um, and then I cast him in, in a flexible material, cast him in rubber and then packed him really tightly into the jar. Um, so this, this kind of concludes the uh, self-portraits exact weight and volume series. Again, where I was trying to make sculpture that were exactly my size. Oh, and I did one more. Right, so back to comic books. Tintin, the Belgian comic book, which has its own racist overtones and it's complicated, but it's translated into a lot of languages, like, like 40 languages. Anyway, I purchased this colonial carving of uh, Thompson and Thompson, spelled differently. And uh, in every translation in every language, their, their names are translated to be like uh, click and clack and uber and gruber and, and all these kind of rhyming names. Anyway, these are these bureaucratic inspectors. The next image lists the names. That's all the different languages that they're translated into and how these two, DuPont and DuPont, uh, Scoppy and Scoffty, um, this kind of play on names, kind of like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And they're these bumbling inspectors, if you know the Tintin comic book. Anyway, I had this colonial figure of this Tintin comic book. And I, so I cast up these, uh, I cast them in every language that they've been translated into. Um, but I cast them in a plaster and I dyed the plaster red. Um, and then I painted them very carefully white. And then I named them all according to the languages. And then I did a performative piece where I broke them all and smashed them in another one of those containers. And this became self-portrait and exact weight and volume for the world. And when I meant the world, really I meant the 111 story World Trade Center building and the kind of calamity and collapse of that building and the 3,400 people who died uh, at that horrible situation. Um, without coincidence, I'm sitting now in my Rockaway living room looking out the window and I can see the new World Trade Center uh, about seven, 10 miles in the distance. Here's a photograph of my brother Paul and I taken in 1969 in April before Gregory's born. Here's a picture of brother Paul and I taken in this very same spot uh, 31 years later, uh, and you see the same uh, collapsed building behind us. My brother Gregory, uh, I'm, I didn't mention it yet, I suppose. My younger bro youngest brother Gregory is a New York City firefighter who perished September 11th uh, in the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And, and that, that was probably the most uh, historic event that uh, unapologetically changed my, my artistic trajectory. Um, I didn't think art would be about my world and the world. Anyway, it just changed how I, how I approached art making. Um, so um, that's the self-portrait and exact weight and volume series as it went from being about me and how big I am, my family, to other ideas about uh, New Orleans and the complications of colonialism and then the com complications and devastation of the World Trade Center and the bumbling, perhaps, of our bureaucracies. I'm not sure what's next. All right, yeah. Um, Mad Magazine. Uh, turns out in Long Island, my, my wife's in-laws married uh, uh, the, the Saleo family. And Dominic Saleo is a, a very successful Mad Magazine uh, illustrator who, who quit his job to hold down a, a steady job with a pension and became a Long Island Railroad worker. Um, but I met him at a couple of family functions. And that prior image, this image, he did this for me based on my drawings. Um, and I couldn't be more happy that I was able to direct uh, a legendary Mad Magazine, Richie Rich uh, illustrator to draw me uh, doing the displacement activity. It's one of my favorite objects to have in the world. Um, uh, Dominic Saleo, by the way, uh, unlike the, uh, the rap game doesn't give him credit, but Dominic Saleo should get full credit. He invented the bling bling illuminated world on Richie Rich's gold. Uh, before that, it wasn't a verbal term. Right, so now we're back in New Orleans and uh, we're a few years after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Lawrence Jenkins, who was there, came to, uh, took me to Rome uh, several times and if you go back in an image, this is, uh, I believe, the, the wall on the Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, um, uh, beautiful uh, uh, cathedral. And uh, on the wall, because Italy doesn't hide its history and it just keeps adding to it, layering it, you see three little markers. And they all say, essentially in Latin, in the eighth year of Pope Gregory IV, the Tiber River reached this level. And uh, I saw this before Hurricane Katrina. 
And it stuck with me because I was like, wow, these people flood a lot and they seem to survive. And really what a flood marker is, is the, the notion of survival. Um, someone had to survive to put the plaque on the wall. And uh, when I came back to New Orleans, I made a sculpture that I titled Flood Marker. And we'll see that now. Or next, yeah. So Flood Marker, here you see a, 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 an 8,000 pound block of black granite that I, I ha carved uh, 1,836 waves into it. One wave for each dead. Kind of trying to steal a little bit from Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial. And also in, in terms of my my amateur graphic design skill, instead of listing the names, I kind of just greeked everything by doing the kind of uh, simple waves. So it became like a big block of water. And then I put it on these rollers, kind of the way I imagined, next slide, the, the Egyptians, um, next, building, uh, that's the Milne Boys Home. It's a beautiful uh, segregated um, reform school for wayward children. Louis Armstrong made it famous. In the ends of these wooden rollers, I branded these pointing hands, kind of finger pointing, uh, mimicking the the idea of the flood marker next, but but also um, next, but but also mimicking um, the idea of, of blaming, pointing blame at people. So, so you're seeing variations of my artwork as they've advanced along. So this is uh, uh, the flood marker in, in New Orleans, which is on in my in my home neighborhood of Gentilly uh, by the Millie Boys Home. And really, I'm proud to say that after uh, all these years, uh, now coming in on uh, 15 years um, or more, it, no one's ever vandalized it. And it stays there with pretty. Uh, Graffiti free, pretty good respect. Um, people sit on it and, and drink beer on it, but they don't. Uh, they don't deface it. They they understand that it, it talks about the survivor's tale, and that's always been kind of flattering. Originally, the piece had wooden rollers beneath it. Oh yeah, on the top it has a plaque. I, I translated the papal Latin into uh, English, and I made a, a great and terrible flood came here in the fifth year of the forty third president of the United States of America. Kind of a little political, but also kind of uh, just inscribing. That something happened and kind of when it happened. Translating popes for presidents. I did a rubbing of it. The neighborhood's been rebuilt. I was asked to come back and change the wooden logs into cement logs so they were more durable. And uh, the piece is now reinstalled and everyone's... New Orleans is doing pretty well. We'll, we'll, do, we'll go through Boatner Park quickly. Um, I was asked to make a sculpture to honor some guy named Eddie Boatner in a park, and it seemed like he was, although he was a wealthy person, he was inconsequential to the community. So I was able to convince the funders to let me embrace the neighborhood. And I broke the, the narratives of the four panels on, on my sculpture into the ancient past, recent past, and uh, ancient past, distant past, recent past. And I talk about uh, how, how the uh, community had changed over the years, St. Thomas Housing Projects. Uh, kind of respectful to the community. That's my tattoo on the, on the top there. This 1970 station wagon. We have, we have a lot of images to see, so we'll keep moving. Yeah, I do this thing where I, um, I guess it's kind of like a non-architectural piece or anti-architecture. Um, I made this really big steel ball, 44 inch diameter steel ball, weighs a lot. And then whenever I show it, I build a scale model of the place I'm showing it. And then I put it in the space. Um, it's kind of fun assignment for me. Uh, and the ball, ironically, hold on, go back one. The ball, ironic, the ball is a survivor. The ball banged around my studio in Gentilly because although it's steel, it's hollow. Uh, quarter inch steel floats like a steel ship. So it floated around the studio in New Orleans. And then I brought it a lot of places. Anyway, anyway, the ball, the ball's indestructible. And whenever I, uh, I'm asked to re-exhibit it. I have to build a new site-specific scale model. Go back one. One more. One more. Sorry. So, so this is you know a recent incarnation where I build a, a small scale model of a, of a gallery. Put a little ball in the room. Go back again. So the little little models in there, and then the big balls there, and it really kind of. As a kid, I loved uh, model railroads and dollhouses, and and just the idea of fantasy and pretend, and, and that Christmas train set below the Christmas tree uh, always, at least for a moment, transports me to that scale model place. And this ball, which is just big, friendly steel object, uh, I gave it kind of a smile. Um, and and Tom, homage to Brad but also Pac-Man. Um, the ball helps give me something to do. I like the busy work of building the scale model of the gallery uh, and then having the big ball cleaned up and rolled in the space. Okay. So that, that's life happened. I, th I think it's the, the 
the goddess, the Roman goddess Fortuna, who balances on the sphere. Um, one, I made this on a, a series of unassembled models. Uh, this is the only one you'll see tonight, I think. And uh, you see me standing on the ball. And I copied the uh, eight states from Frank Sinatra's song, That Life, That's Life. Um, a pauper, poet, king, up, down, over, and under. And they go on each of these panels. We can keep going. Right, so, so uh, I showed you this image a while ago. Go back, uh, next one, next. Yeah, so this is the uh, stainless steel cabinet in my living room in New Orleans when we pried the, the swollen wooden door open and came back after Hurricane Katrina, had my whole house underwater. So, so this looks pretty safe and clean, but the whole house is underwater. And when you come into a house that's been underwater, it looks okay because like your furniture is still there, but it's kind of you know, moldy and destroyed. But you wonder where the water went. And in this case, uh, the water mostly drains away. It was pumped out of the city. But all of those uh, martini glasses and wine glasses were full to the very, very brim with Katrina water because the water got in when the tide slowly came up. But the water couldn't get out. And this really inspired me or had me thinking. So I careful, when I was cleaning my, my, my uh, late mother's Waterford Crystal, I carefully poured the water into a five-gallon jug. I don't know why exactly, but I, I, I keep the water and, uh, because it, it was Hurricane Katrina, literally, in my house. And I, I wanted to have it as a physical uh, reminder. Um, but the, the glasses full of water were really, really important to me. Uh, and they stayed with me for a while. And that led to this other body of work, which is coming now. I started, when I lived in my FEMA trailer with Adrian and back in the old days, um, I started um, drawing uh, plastic water jugs. So it was all the water in New Orleans. You had, to bring, you, had to, you had to buy it yourself. You had to bring it yourself. So I, then I made these. I'm a sculptor. I'm a sculptor, not a, not a, I'm not just a two-dimensional artist. I'm really a sculptor. So I made these uh, steel brands, and I started branding um, paper. So here's a series of self-portraits um, where I just tallied people's volume. So on the, you see uh, the pints, quarts, and gallons burned into the wooden board. Um, and that was interesting enough and, and moderately successful. And, and here's a family, and to the right is my self-portrait. Was It's my height and width. Here's my friend Christian Rapal and his little dog, Bender. Um, and then I had, so I had these little steel shapes made, and then I started getting kind of anti-physical and, and, and ethereal and making these twittering little mobiles. We can keep going. Uh, so this is a self-portrait of a tally of my weight and volume, where they were very small pieces that would blow in the wind. Burning paper started now. And then uh, making paper with my friend Amy and Tatiana at Dudene Paper Mill uh, kind of reconnected everything together. I'm collaging in little, little pieces of uh, comic books and newspapers and subway maps. I'm so playing with polish, polished metal. Oh, yeah. So then I'm in New Orleans. I'm, I'm out of New Orleans. I'm in New York City. I'm teaching in Adelphi. And I'm finally back in New York. And my house floods again for Hurricane Sandy. So if you go back a couple of slides. Yeah, this one. This, the, the, the picture on the left is my front door on October 29th, 2012. My birthday, by the way. And that's Hurricane Sandy. And if you look, this is me inside my house. And you can see down at the bottom some leaves floating in the water about a foot below the doorknobs. You, you can also see one of the doorknobs has some water kind of pissing in. And then if you look outside the door, like a Looney Tunes cartoon, you see a line of water. The water is higher outside my house than inside my house. So Michael and I have a flashlight in our teeth because the power is off. And I discover this. This is uh, illuminated by the flashbulb of a little camera. Um, so anyway, this house is underwater. The water kept coming in. We all panicked. We survived, but it was a big mess. Um, but then once again, I had another flooded situation. So then here I, I had a great and terrible flood happened here too because my art got creamed yet again. Okay, next slide. Where are we? Right, so, so now I'm, a, I'm not quite depressed, but I'm really losing my optimism. So I did a show called The End of Optimism. Um, paper making becomes a larger part of my work. Um, I, I, I kind of discovered this technique by layering thin sheets of linen pulp to make these isometric kind of drawings um, with, with the tonal layering. And I like those pieces fine, but they never really had any culminating value. But then I'm asked to do a show at the Good Children Gallery on the, this is strange. Oh, this is a drawing I made like, go back. This is a drawing I made of the World Trade Center the seven buildings plus a 16-acre underground site. And then next to it, I have kind of a, a detonation a plunger. Uh, and I made this drawing in my notebook. Actually, I think while we were driving to, to Dallas-Fort Worth on a UNO field trip, like in 
maybe 07. And I made the drawing and didn't think much of it. But then I'm asked to do an exhibition which falls on to September 11, 2011, 10 years after the tragic event. And I guess once I had a year advance notice, but that's the date I was given, I thought I would address the conflict head on. And I wouldn't skirt the issue, but I'd make a body of work about September 11, 2001. And that's the series you'll see now. So, so I went back to that paper technique where I layered the thin pulp and I, I had the organized geometry and then I had that wonderful chaotic um, uh, and uncontrollable viscosity of the, of the, of the papermaking process. And so this is not painted or drawn. It's all made at once from the liquid pulp. And it's that the kind of uh, geometry and then also the uh, inexactness of the, uh, the leakage, letting the pulp leak out. And then I foiled it with uh, branded images of my, my brother Gregory uh, uh, with those, those, and I, those fluid volumes. And, I, and suddenly everything made sense. The papermaking technique that I had developed, didn't know why, but now it made perfect sense. I could build this, this uh, I could build these World Trade Centers of cloud pieces um, because although I was a sculptor who made dozens of works that weighed tons in steel and stone, now I needed a piece that was uh, weightless and objectless. And then um, I've got these brands I've made. So for the 10th year anniversary, I was able to brand you know, 10 shot glasses, 10 cups of coffee, 10, um, 10 quarts of milk. Uh, and in a way, it became a way of recording time, like, like uh, if you're in prison and you're tallying your years behind bars. Um, and, and that was pretty uh, important. And, and this body of work has, has had pretty good audience and it's traveled pretty wide and far. I've even made them larger in different versions. Um, and uh, they, 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 they do a good job of expressing the situation, um, I think. And as a sculptor, to not make objects I think this was the empowering moment where I felt like I was making objects. They were just very thin objects, and they were still very process-bound. Here's uh, me at a Dudenay paper mill uh, with my lovely daughter, Felicia, helping us one day. And again, I, I wanted to give Amy and Tatiana full credit for being my collaborators in that body of work. Th this is probably the highlight of my career. This, this, is, um, this is my artwork in the in New York City subway system, advertising an exhibition I did at the World Trade Center Museum. And it was so wonderful to have people graffitiing my artwork, the poster of my artwork, the same way I put a mustache on Harrison Ford in the Raiders of the Lost Ark poster just 25 or 30 years prior. Uh, it was fun to be everywhere. Um, uh, ironically, to go back one, ironically, next to my picture of, of uh, World Trade Center as a Cloud and the title of the exhibition being Rendering the Unthinkable, you see, uh, if you see something, say something, the uh, dystopian uh, snitch on your neighbor's uh, world we live in now, where, um, you know, uh, it's just crazy. And, and, but if you would have told me that these two images would need to exist and exist in the subway side by side when I was, you know, 20 or 30, I would have said impossible. But really, I think one could unpack the complexity of these two images and write a, a lengthy uh, thesis on, on where our national psyche is and and how we got there or, or how we allowed ourselves to get there. Next. Yeah. We can keep moving along. We can't talk about everything. BP oil spill. Yeah, I, I'll just say concisely, I'm really an object maker, and this piece is a big, fragile object. And I wanted, I made this for a show in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, go back to one of those pictures of the object. That's fine. This is um, me branding a six-pack onto maps of places that had flooded. Um, and in, in set in the six-pack, I, I put pictures of the moon landing. I always felt that it was unfortunate that we could go to the moon in 1969, but we couldn't build a cement wall around a city. Um, clearly, we could have. We just didn't want to. This sculpture has got 2,000 pounds of uh, oyster shells from P&G Oysters uh, on Rampart Street, New Orleans. And uh, I built this kind of fragile sculpture on top of it kind of reminiscent of the childhood game I had called Don't Break the Ice, where a little chair sits on top of a, a fragile field of little blocks. Um, and each of the green glass blocks is a different thickness. I cast these glass blocks and built this intricate wooden structure. Um, and the whole thing was intended to remind us of how fragile our throne is and how fragile of a situation we're sitting on and how we make every possible uh, accommodation and adjustment to pretend everything's just right on the top. But underneath it, it's really a house of cards, and it's all quite fragile. I did a show in Vienna, Austria, where I, had a, I included the, uh, so the Gulf of Mexico, Rockaway, uh, and, and uh, the Philippines. Anywhere that flooded became my, my sister city. 
and I was sympathetic to uh, all those places. Uh, Oyster Shell Kingdoms is the name of that, that body of work. We can move along. We can keep going. We'll, we'll spare this for later. So while I switch slides, um, burning and fire and such is, is obviously like a medium that you keep coming back to. Is there a particular reason why? Uh, yeah, f uh, fire and water. Um, they've been around for a long time. They predate us. Uh, those, those primordial forces can't be beat. And I love conjuring them and the evidence of them in my work. I think when you can see a piece of paper that has been both, both made with the viscosity of water and then burned through the power of fire, I think there's just something really seductive about that. And I, and I do want to seduce my viewer by giving them something that maybe they're not aware of why they like it or why they want to stick around and give it a chance. But I do, you, you need to invite your viewer in. And uh, fire and water are a nice way to grab your viewer and say, remember these things that we've known forever? They're really important, and here they are. Um, here's, here's water bottle buoys, which is a, a nice tongue twister. Um, so after my second flood, I, um, I felt like there'd be a lot of floods coming. And then if you read the paper or the old White House website, you'd know that, that there was a time when our nation agreed that the water was rising. And again, I'm talking now and look, looking at Jamaica Bay outside my window, and uh, water's everywhere. Anyway, so, so this is an interesting piece. I wanted to make a body of work where it would not be destroyed in a flood, but the inverse would happen. I wanted to make a body of artwork where when it flooded, it would be completed by the flood. So in Kevin Costner's water world, these sculptures will survive. Each one's tied to a 200-foot um, line of rope, and they'll float up. I, there should be an image of a, of a de demonstration tank, if you go back one, like a kind of a big beaker of water. There you go. So, so that's the demonstration tank. So when the earth is covered with a 50-foot tidal surge, um, my sculptures will pop up out of the water, anchored to the bottom of the new urban seabed, and uh, they will become our cultural markers. I, I chose the water bottle because I was kind of in love with these containers of fluid volume, but also because I was really conflicted or I was really motivated about the, the duality of water and what I call the good water and the bad water. The good water is the stuff we need to drink and stay alive. The bad water is the stuff that comes to drown us. The plastic bottles of water are kind of bad because they hurt the environment, unless you're really thirsty and really want one, in which case they're kind of good. And I kind of enjoyed that duality. On the top of these, I branded a bunch of uh, nonsensical maps uh, and because the, the world will be reformed when the tides come up. And I like the kind of humble water bottles. Sometimes I used anchors. Sometimes I used uh, anchors. Sometimes I used buoys. I've done a lot of embroidery by now. I'm burning paper. I'm embroidering paper. Uh, everyone in New York sells a bottle of water for one dollar, and uh, I've, you know the, the fundamental idea that we have to pay for water, um, although cold water might be worth it. Anyway, and I gave them these kind of coffin crates, little blocks of water. And so, as we pull this one up, uh, this is going to cover a piece that's actually in the Ava collection. My family has been doing some coloring. I hope you're all doing the same. Yeah. Right, so the, the com comic book diplomacy piece series, which is ongoing and getting more and more complicated, I'm, and I'm making a pretty cool series now of comic, book, comic books with flow charts on them. I've kind of put the maps on hold for a while. Um, comic book diplomacy, so I traveled a lot, started with Lawrence Jenkins in Rome at the Porto Portesi flea market, buying, um, buying a, uh, comic books from from uh, little junk shops and, and i was amazed that the uh, fantastici quattro is is uh, the same fantastic four i had in uh, in brooklyn you know in rome and then you know in uh die spiny in germany is spider-man and and uh, uh all these comic books exist back to the colonial um the colonial sculpture this is this other colonial thing we do we export some of our lowbrow culture um, and, and I have no problem with it. I, I, well, it's complicated, but I love them. So kind of like a, like a pretend sociologist, I started collecting comic books so long as the title was not written in English. It had to be a, a comic book that I couldn't read myself um, because then it became an object and, and more of a cultural object. Um, Lapper Latin is a Finnish, a super hombre, obviously Spanish. 
uh, Los Supersonicos. Um, if you go back, go back one. Um, can you find find one where we can see the map on them? A big one. There we go. So I, I started. I started. I had fallen in love with maps and diagrams and information. So I started doing these big collages. I, I made more steel brands, and now I'm making the the five elements required on a map are uh, the compass rose, the scale bar, the actual map. Uh, a name ribbon, and then whoever the agency that created the map has to say who they are, claiming responsibility for that data. Um, so one, two, three, four, five things go on a map. So I started making these comic book diplomacy maps where I, I, I thought I could talk about, um, well, comic book diplomacy, the idea that, that uh, an Israeli young boy and a Palestinian young boy grow up to shoot rockets at one another, but when they're 12 years old or nine years old, they both have the same hero, the same immortal god, right? Superman's immortal. Um, so it gets kind of complicated. And, and I, I was amazed that, that all this Arabic Superman, there's, there's Israeli Superman, I mean, that we translate into those languages. So I started buying these comic books from my extended travels, from my networks of friends who were out and about, and also through um, eBay. Anyway, if we could jump through a few of these... Um, and back to your earlier question about why I was dealing with water and fire. I, I, I was playing with the comic books because in, in spite of how we all know it's a bad idea to judge a book by its cover, um, I really do judge a book by its cover. We all judge books by their covers. And the best covers are comic book covers. And I love them. And to have, if you go back one. So the central image is, is a, a Hong Kong um, Superman. And I overlaid it with, with Mighty Mouse cutting some cheese, kind of a lowbrow, highbrow. And then I, 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 I carefully burned into the comic books a map of the Pacific Ocean with uh, North and South America and then, and then Japan and uh, uh, Asian India uh, on, the, on the left, um, Australia at the bottom. And I, I wanted the information of a map and the, I guess, the irrefutable information of a map, the fact that we just kind of believed them. Um, and then I wanted to play with these, this this colonial export and 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 the idea of uh, if we can all have the same false god superheroes, why can't we get along? Um, if you, the magnetic north piece that's in your collection, we could maybe jump ahead and find one, maybe a, a close up. Yeah, I, I also do a lot of embroidery now. My my childhood friend, a retired firefighter, David Samoa's. Uh, has had me as an unsalaried artist in residence at Brooklyn Chain Stitch, where they they put monograms on towels for the last fifty years, and now I get to do that um, on my comic books and on my collages. So I was kind of burning the comic books apart. That's kind of important. I have two rules to the comic book thing. When I when I add something to them, it's always a blank sheet of paper. So I always kind of erase by adding. And also, I I burn the paper. I've tried painting on them. I've tried drawing on them. And it doesn't doesn't compete with that 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 bold graphic cartoon line. The the only thing that competes is is that burned steel fire line. Um, it, it it's again it's irrefutable and it changes everything. Again, making these not just images but objects. And I know that's kind of weird because we're looking at it on your computer screen, but they're they're images, not objects. I mean, they're, they're objects, not images. I mentioned recently, Magnetic North and True North confuse me, and I don't know what that means exactly, except they're not the same. So I was trying to deal with that here. Um, and then I, I buy the, go back a couple. Yeah, I, I try to buy comic books that are, um, I, per, I prefer the patina of time. So they're cheaper, and I, I like the rusty staples and the torn edges. And I love it when they have someone's name on them from 1955 or, or a postmark on them, because I really want that history that somebody previously owned and cherished and enjoyed them. Also, when I embroider the white thread over the, the burned images, it picks up the soot and it kind of uh, feels like stitches or sutures on, a, on, a, on an injury. Sometimes I keep them uh, in pieces. Sometimes there's no compass rows. So on your left, you see a Batman and Robin, and then it's a Israeli. Uh, go back one. Roto Blitz is German for the Flash. Um,
targets. You, you can't beat a target. Targets are where it's at. Yeah. So we only have uh, about 10 more minutes. Okay, cool. So here's the, here's, go back to the image mm -hmm. of, this is the, we'll, we'll wrap it up. This is the image that on one of your uh, coloring book sheets. And, and um, I'm, I'm not a real photographer. Um, but I do like to compose and de design my photographs. So here's an image of uh, three. The piece is called Neapolitan. And we can conclude with this image. It, it's, a, it's three glasses full exactly halfway. And uh, you can see I've got them uh, in front of the horizon line of Jamaica Bay uh, with the sea behind me. And although it's not visible, Manhattan is behind that with the World Trade Center in lower Manhattan, the new World Trade Center. And then you've got these three glasses with superheroes on them and they're fluid volume containers. And then they're each filled exactly halfway because the glass is not half empty and the glass is not half full. The glass is just filled halfway. And that's back to my idea about the end of optimism. Um, and then I got the superhero. These, these are from our cupboard in, in our kitchen. And uh, I used the plain milk, chocolate milk, and strawberry quick to represent the uh, Neapolitan ice cream the, of my childhood, the idea of the, the fanciful flavors all put in one uh, container, one box. Um, yeah, I feel pretty strongly about that. Um, if we're out of time, we can conclude, or we can jump to the maybe the embroidered blood. Yeah, I was exactly. I was thinking the exact same thing. Um, Great. I definitely want us, uh, Rachel. I saw there were some chats. Was um, so there's no questions yet, but if y'all have questions, um, go ahead and put them in the chat now, and we can spend the last couple of minutes uh, talking about your questions. So this is a show I did last year called Universala. Universala is a um, is a Esperanto word for universal. Esperanto is that language that was going to unify the planet because we'd all speak one language. It didn't work out. Um, you can still give confession uh, in, in Esperanto at Vatican. Um, go back one. Could you go back one image? Okay. So the Red Cross is what we have in Christendom. The Red Crescent is what we have in the world of Islam. The red crystal is in places that don't have either of those things. Then the David Magna Adam, Star of David. Uh, and then below that, the, the really, really awesome Persian symbol for their uh, aid agency, uh, current, current Iran, uh, the, the lion, sword, and sun. Um, I find it fascinating that even getting an ambulance is secular, is religious. Um, so I made these, I, I mentioned this to somebody recently, but my dog hit me in the nose in his enthusiasm and I had a bloody nose for the first time in years. I used a towel to wipe it up. It sat around, we laundered it, the blood wouldn't come out. So I embroidered all these red cross insignia, red crystal, red crescent, all these aid agency insignia to form the, this blood mark. We, we, maybe we can see a detail if we go ahead. Yeah, so, so it became very painterly and, and rich and beautiful, but I got to put a crescent, a star David, and a cross on the same uh, work of art and uh, make these blood drops. We can move through these, but I did a show called Universala where I, where I talked about, um, you know, equality and difference. And again, if we all have either, you know, A, B, O, or A, B blood, why can't we get along? Um, and I started playing with, continue playing with these Red Cross blankets, which I've been embroidering for years and uh, repurposing some existing sculpture. This is the three bears, too tall, too short, just right. Um, where some early embroidery happened. Um, and, uh, Next. Yeah. Here's a Red Cross blanket where, where I kind of uh, shot the blanket and uh, let the blanket bleed. Um, and then embroidered it with images of pointing hands back to the uh, flood marker piece and also to uh, handguns. Um, obviously, we have an epidemic of uh, violence. Yeah. So the, the piece in the back we could talk about, uh, it's called Us, Them, and Other. And the, the idea that like a pie graph of dividing groups into like left-handed, right-handed, and ambidextrous or and straight, gay, and bisexual, or whatever categories you want to break things into. For this object, again, very physically, and back to the idea of fire, um, I made an object out of sheet metal, I carefully fabricated it, I carefully painted it, and then I violently welded over that finished edge to get the kind of explosive, kind of crescendo firework moment. So this is an uh, exhibition of objects and images. Um, I guess a little tongue-in-cheek, but the, the, the green... The green uh, Green is uh, copper-based Vulcan blood, and you can see the uh, live, long, and prosper symbol there in the center. This piece is under construction, but it's uh, almost finished. 
Christina, we have a couple questions. Okay. Time. So starting with a fun question, and then it's followed by a more serious one. So the fun question is, which flavor did your family eat first on the Neapolitan? Ours was chocolate, left the strawberry to last. I don't think anyone over the age of 10 and under the age of 90 likes strawberry. <laughs> it's really a flavor for the very old, the very young. And me, I kind of like strawberry too. <laughs> the little freezer burn chunks of strawberry are delicious. Yeah. Um, vanilla goes first to my family. <laughs> and then the more serious question uh, from Kevin. You have made some of your art based on major events like 9-11. Do you think you'll make something inspired by the coronavirus pandemic? Yes, I'm sure I will. It took me 10 years to address Hurricane Katrina head on. I'm sorry, to address September 11th head on, but it had already been seeping into my work in other ways. Um, I got the news of my test results being positive a couple of days ago, and I, I feel like 90%. I'm fine. Um, and I'm thinking like coronavirus, which we see that little icon of that, like uh, little Horton, here's a who, little germ. Um, and it's, you know, still in my nasal passages. And it's, it's a, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, yes, it will appear in my work somehow. Uh, but whether it's about the disease itself or about my fear of being put on a ventilator and having my hands tied at my side uh, a couple months ago when all this started, when, when ERs and hospitals were overrun, I, I don't think it'll be that literal. Hopefully it'll appear in a more discreet way. Um, I mean, the World Trade Center triggered my interest in comic books from around the world. I mean, it doesn't always have to be a literal uh, application of, of the theme. Um, and I hate to say it, but I don't think coronavirus is going to just be about the 100,000 Americans dead. And, and, and uh, I think it's, it's the uh, social divide of how we embrace the notion of healthcare in our nation that it's probably a better question to ask then than about just this this uh, COVID uh, virus blowing in the wind. I mean, it's it's uh, complicated. So so yes, my work will likely embrace coronavirus. I was never too I was never too comfortable you, uh, implementing um, September 11th, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy in my work. I was never too comfortable with it because I, I always wondered if, if the audience would always say, wow, this, this guy's brother died and then his house flooded twice. Yeah, give his work a chance. I, I didn't want that to be the criteria for my work having, having agency. Um, that's not a thing to desire, you know? Um, so in some ways, anonymity would be fine, you know? Um, I don't know. We've elevated our houses. They won't flood again. And uh, my wife has antibodies to coronavirus. We're doing okay. I don't know. <laughs> so it'll creep, it'll creep in when it gets here. We'll see what happens. Well, uh, sorry I about that. Yeah. Well, we're, we're always excited to see new work by you. And um, I'm excited that you were able to join us. Um, are there any, we did have one more comment. Interesting question because now I tend to want exact amounts of each in the dessert cup. Um, <laughs> going back to the, the strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate. Um, so I need to uh, cancel the spotlight video so that way um, I can put it back to grid view. And if you guys have been working on the coloring sheets, I did not get as far as I thought I would. Um, why don't you hold them up to the screen? And so that way we can get a snapshot here in a little bit. Ooh. Ooh. Some good stuff there. Awesome. Go to the next screen too. Yay. Well, thank you guys. Um, and be sure if you're not finished like me, I still need to finish mine later tonight. Um, be sure to uh, post it online on, or if you have finished on Instagram or Facebook and tag us at Ava UAB. Um, and <laughs> And, and Michael. <laughs> Hi. When did Michael get home? <laughs> I'm just meeting the first oh, there's time. Oh, there's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay. Hey, um, th everyone, th thanks for uh, thanks for listening for me for an hour. Um, 
<laughs> I enjoyed talking to you all, and you can get in touch with me via Facebook or my email or through uh, UAB. I'm always happy to engage questions about my favorite subject, which is my work. <laughs> Bye, buddy. Good to see you.